Yo! Video games. What up, dudes, and welcome back to the Yo! Video Games Podcast. I'm Matt. And I'm Andrew. And once again, thank you to all our generous patrons who've kept us going for over 400 episodes. Yeah, if you're interested in becoming a patron at any level, please check out patreon.com slash Podcast. Dude of the week is Zybernite. Thank you, Zybernite. Actually, I, I think longtime dude, but new producer. Longtime uh, listener, new new producer. Uh, sends us sends us the lowdown on a bunch of different interesting lowdown games. And stuff. S- sends me a lot of really cool stuff um, to help out with my stream, too. So, Hell yeah. Damn. Big, uh, big shout out to Zyber Knight. Uh, very, also very. S- sent me the stuff for uh, Gray Zone Warfare, which yes. we still haven't gotten a beta yet, but we're looking forward to that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm still very intrigued by, by checking that out. Uh, so, yeah, last week we had an interesting episode. It definitely spurred discussion. I didn't, although I was a little disappointed, at least on on the on the YouTube end, of how many people didn't actually listen. And just commented on the title of the video because, like, we literally, like, that is literally the, all the points of discussion. <laughs> like, no, we, we, <laughs> one guy, one guy commented, then watched more of it, then came back angrier <laughs> and, like, started a fight with a bunch of different people. <laughs> I, 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 it was, that's, it was a good comment section. It, it was funny. I think I don't know if it was last episode or some other video of mine, but like that. I'll just say this: if you think Reggie ever wrote a line of code in his life, oh yeah, no, that was that was the Nintendo episode. Yeah, he, he did not. <laughs> so yeah, he was a salesman for the longest time. He was a sale, a good salesman, but he he didn't make his. He had nothing. He has never touched game develop, development in any capacity. I. Not to say that, like, you have to be a developer to be a good CEO. I think people see, like, getting to that point in my life (laughs) with how bad things are going in this industry, with everything, with everything going on. I'm like, you know what? Maybe we should. I mean, ideally, ideally, the CEO would be intimate with the business that they're running. But Mm -hmm. a CEO's job almost always is like half marketing half macro business decisions it's not you know it's not like uh they need to make decisions Mm -hmm. day to day on development so it doesn't mean you don't have to be a developer to be a good ceo in gaming but i think you know that is one big difference where people think of reggie and reggie was a charismatic ceo yeah well well, reggie um, to give reggie some credit here um he deserves a lot of credit really and he talked about it too in his book and, and and in interviews when he got hired by Nintendo, he went in on a big binge to learn everything he could of the ins and outs of the industry. Like he yeah. wasn't, he wasn't like some hardcore game. He wasn't a gamer at all, really, when he, you know, when he was brought in. But like when he did get the job, it wasn't to it wasn't just like, all right, well, like let me let me like look at the right. you just look at a bunch of pie charts and then make a decision. Um which uh sad to say, uh I have firsthand experience that there are people like that. Yeah, absolutely. You can see Those, it all the time. For me, it was bar charts. <laughs> so bar charts up, yeah. It'd be like, oh, well, the increase here is, you know, like, but that's uh, the whole bar charts, 2%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fake. It's exaggerated. Charts mm-hmm. lie. If you learn only one thing from me as a person, let it not be any of my knowledge of life. Let it be the bar charts lie. <laughs> the bar charts lie. <laughs> all the bar charts lie. <laughs> So speaking of charts and everything, that's kind of like going into what we're, what we're going to talk about today. And, and that is uh, a sort of an, another what if episode. Um, and that is what if the GameCube was successful? And a lot of people will say, well, Nintendo's always successful. I, I can hear it already. You know, GameCube was successful, made proud. Da, 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 da. The GameCube sold less worldwide than the N64 by a decent margin. Sold less than the N64. The N64 sold less than the Super NES, obviously. The Super NES sold less than the, the Famicom, uh, the nope. NES. So it was a downward trend all the way down into, into the like mid to low 20 millions. Like, uh, hold on, let me just screw it. Let me just pull it up for you. So yeah, I swear to God, if you pull up a fucking bar chart, 
It's not a hard <laughs> chart. It's, it's 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 raw numbers, baby. Um, <laughs> the, the sexy chart. The raw number, 21, 21.74 million GameCubes were sold. I don't know. I don't know if people are aware of this, but that's critically bad. The, the, the Xbox Series S and X has sold more than the GameCube did in its entire life. And, 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 they're, and they're doing and, and, and they're doing terrible, right? Well, they're yeah. doing terrible. They're they're doing it. It's the Xbox One sold more than this. The original Xbox sold more than the GameCube. Not by much, but it sold more. So when, when, I'm, when I'm telling you that the GameCube was not successful, there's a reason they pivoted to the Wii. The GameCube was Nintendo's last attempt at going for graphics. And before they, they basically went to their Blue Ocean strategy. Why did they go to their Blue Ocean strategy? Why did they go to the Wii? Because of the GameCube, because it wasn't successful. And you could argue that... The it wasn't a mistake. It's been, it's been highly successful for years now. The switch is still highly successful. Like there's no, there's not really a lot of reason for them to go back to a graphics hardware centric, you know, uh, mm -hmm. model. Would I like them to? Yes. I, I'm back and forth on that now, considering how overblown and expensive and, you know, much of a clusterfuck um, video game development has become. No, that's true, but like at the same time, I don't need it to be the PS5's equal. One, mm -hmm. the PS5 is not even putting out things that the PS5 requires. Uh, one of the big reasons why I'm like, who the fuck is going to buy a pro? But whatever. Uh, you know, I just I don't want it. I don't want it to run like a potato. I don't want it to chug, especially mm -hmm. when there's other handhelds out there that are already doing the high end. You already see the highest in the handheld. Give me like a midline don't be the bottom of the barrel anymore that's all i'm asking you don't have to be the bottom of the barrel let the i don't know the ipad or the mobile phone actually aren't most cell phones more powerful than the switch yeah anyway? at this point well new ones sure so, yeah so um so again i'm not trying to hate on nintendo for going the route that they've gone it's obviously been successful and i would argue that the wii was but when the Wii came out, I shit on it when it first got announced. And then it ended up being the number one console we played at every get together, hangout, like game night. They were like it was always the Wii. Otherwise, it was just one dude sitting on a couch while everyone watched him play it. The Wii is like a party console. Um is great. And again, like every dorm room that I went to while in college, like every dorm room had a Wii in it. Yep. So I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and pretend that like, oh, you know, uh, the Wii was a mistake. It wasn't. But if the GameCube was successful, the Wii wouldn't have existed. Right. We would have. I would say that's a probably a probably a fair assessment that the then pivoting so hard to the Blue Ocean strategy, um, which the Blue Ocean strategy is leave leave the waters that are bloodied from competition and go out into the rest of the ocean where no one no one's gone before. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask if that was a pirate reference, but it it was just what it, it's a it's a book that Nintendo got sold on, like uh, Iwata and others, like uh, like really, and they, they they it's called Blue Ocean Strategy, and and that's what they that's what they've termed it, that's what they call it in oh. interviews all the time. It's they have they have referred to it as a Blue Ocean Strategy all the time. So, um, yeah, don't compete, do something new. Yeah, well, just kind of like he, everyone's fighting over the same. It's like everyone, everyone's fighting over the same fish. You know, every shark is fighting over the same fish in, in the same spot. Or you could go out into the rest of the ocean where there is no competition. That's smart. So that was their thing. Was like you know what? There's because I mean, really, when you really do think about it, with the GameCube era, it was a the video game industry. As much as it was expanding, it was still also extremely insular. It was very much targeted at 20-something-year-old males. That was the only audience anyone was going for. In the early 2000s, especially, yeah. Right, which is you know, when the GameCube was around. Yeah. So at that point in time, the GameCube was... The, 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 I'm sorry, the, GameCube, the whole video game industry was a very insular, um, young adult, male-oriented audience. And that's where, you know, it, you know, to get a little off topic here, you know, when some people get like, you know, 
kind of whiny about games like uh, like Stellar Blade coming out. It's hyper this hyper sexualized game, which the, the problem lies more with the devs, not really with the with the game itself. But like, I don't really, I don't think it's a problem to have a cheesecake game existing. Because we don't live in an era where that's the only thing that can exist. Because when the GameCube was out during the era of Dead or Alive Beach Volleyball and you know Leisure Suit yeah. Larry Magna Cum Loud, um, that was the the guy game era, if you will, if we want to be really you know to the point, the guy game era of video gaming. That that was the only right. games that got made. That's the only games that got published. The only games that got. Put. We're not in that industry anymore. Indie games thrive. Comfy games thrive. We have tons of games for women, by women, for women, um, by all all walks of life. We're just cottage core games, right? We don't live in an yeah. era. We we do not live in a video game industry that is that is only interested in in young twenty something year old males. Um, it, it does make it stand out more though when when one of those games come out, which is an odd double edged blade, right? It's only really odd because it's a first party money hat release where Sony paid, you know, a Korean uh, developer who makes like a, a big, you know, tits and ass mobile game um, right. to make them a big booty, you know, high budget PS5 exclusive. Where it's kind of like, really, that's what you want. Sony, the company that brought us Last of Us and Last of Us 2 and Horizon 1 and 2. Like you you want you wanted the weird, the weird fetish game. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, Go I mean, from pretty girls who stink like ass because they haven't showered in 30 days to beautiful Android who stinks like nothing because she doesn't need showers. She, she probably smells like a car. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of dudes right now <laughs> unzipping. <laughs> like, there's a lot of dudes who just machine oil Ooh, god like <laughs> oh god that's hot um, but anyways yeah like so and that one and, and again this was part of the gamecube or sorry leaving the gamecube going into the wii strategy was you know you know wada talked about this i was there when he when he was on stage saying like you know there were people who were sometimes gamers or there are people who never gamed might might be interested and there's people who just never game it, which was funny because he acknowledged that there were some people that like never, never gonna play video. But he went after grandparents. He went after grandma and grandpa, and he went after he went after you know women who were vastly unrepresented at, at the time with the with the launch of the original Wii. Like he, like the idea was like stop appealing to just me, you know, uh, you know, a, person, a young a young adult male, and start appealing to everybody. And like you said, this had a this had a, a sort of snowballing effect. Where all of a sudden every dorm room had it, you know, all, oh, all, yeah. all, you know, every time people got together to play video games, we were playing like, boom blocks or, or something, you know, so. Well, it, it also helped that by the time, within only a couple of years, it seemed like the Wii was the most affordable system. Now, granted. It, it was the most affordable be. at launch. Right. Yeah. So it's like, they, did they ever drop the price of the Wii? I feel yeah. like now they don't drop shit, but they did. They did. I mean, it was because it, GameCube dropped fast because it came. It, it, GameCube came out at two hundred and it and it dropped to a hundred kind of quickly. Um, right. Didn't again. The GameCube didn't even last five years. GameCube was a four year system. Um, the Wii was two fifty at launch, and then eventually it started going down to two hundred. And then there was there was hundred dollar Wiis. It was a really weird like like black and red little like. It looks like a, a small compact CD player, and it exists. It's like a Wii Mini. Um, it's a it's a real thing. It exists. Uh, Nintendo made it. Um, didn't take off too well uh, off for obvious reasons, but yeah, yeah, it, oh. it was it was a thing. Uh, but yeah, they they did they did start off a price. But the thing is, when two when it launched at two fifty, um, the the Xbox three hundred and sixty was I believe four hundred dollars. I believe. Uh, around about four hundred dollars, and then there was the PS3 that got announced. This came out the same exact time, same month for six hundred, five hundred. If you want to look like, the cheaper right. version, you know, so six hundred dollars system. So um, I'll never forget that they they literally spawned a weird meme. Peter Moore, got, you know, one of the one of the greats <laughs> of the game industry, where people were interviewing him at E3 because he was at Microsoft at the time. He was heading up Xbox, Xbox yeah. 360, and and they were like. You know, they're asking him about the competition because the Wii was this revealed, the PS3 is this real. And he said, like, oh, he said, let's be real here, guys. Like, you know, Sony, Sony's insane. Like, 
they're not nobody's going to buy a six hundred dollar PS3. They're going to buy a three sixty, and then they're going to buy a Wii with the with the same amount of money for one PS3. <laughs> like his whole thing was like, yeah, we offer the high end games, and then they're going to buy a Wii for fun. And, yeah. and and the strange thing was, he was absolutely effing right for like the first three to four years of the system's life. That's exactly what happened in America. He didn't miss very many times. <laughs> so. Like every story I've ever heard of him is usually him pretty friggin' right. <laughs> yeah, and, and Sony had to drastically start dropping the PS3 price, cutting stuff out of the PS3 right away. Like, you know, bring the price way down. And they didn't really turn that, that, that crap around until like halfway into the system's life or more. But yeah, for the longest time, there was a thing called the Wii 60. Where people would buy a 360 and Wii. That was me for the longest time. Uh, my brother, that's what he did. He got, he, uh, yeah, I think he got his Wii. And then like a few weeks later, because the 360 was sold out all over the place for a while mm -hmm. around us. Uh, I don't think it was sold out like everywhere the way the PS5 was sold out because of scalpers. But like. There was a good amount of so he went with the intention to get a 360, saw they had a Wii, and he grabbed he just grabbed a Wii. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh I had a 360 for almost six months before I could get a game because I blew my whole load on on the 360 and then had to save and save for the game. Well the the the, the crazy funny thing was was that what I got a Wii. 360 came out in 2005, and then 2006 was the Wii PS3. Mm -hmm. and by 2007, COD 4 hit, and then everyone's life sort of changed. Yep. <laughs> well, the the very first game that I got on the 360, I think, was Oblivion. Mm, that was a launch game. Yeah, I think I got a. I think I got Oblivion, um, and then I can't remember what my brother first got. Or no, man, no, you know what? I got Quake. I got the Quake that came. And he got Oblivion, and then we swapped because he he got a, he got a game for Christmas, and then did not get the console for like a full year, I think, after it was out. Whereas I I got the console and then got a game. I don't know, it was weird. It was weird, but he had a Wii, and he uh, he had like all the accessories for the Wii too. He loved that system. Actually, yeah. I don't really know anybody that got a Wii that hated the Wii. Not if they played it. Yeah, I guess uh, if, you, if you ignored it, it was. There, there's a ton of hidden gems, but that that's 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 sort of where we are now. That's the that's the timeline we lived through, which which led to the Wii. But we're talking about what if it didn't? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but I I think one of the key things we should establish, and you were you were mentioning this just before we started to record, uh, how would this have happened? How did our yeah. what if come about? What what are the things that had to have happened that didn't happen in the real world, but should have happened? You know, I, and I think you said you probably had like three things, key things that needed to happen early on. Cause right. if, when I say like what to me, the Wii X success, I'm not talking about like something where like the system's been out for six months or a year, or like, Oh, if they only did this, or if they only got GTA three to also come out on the system with the Xbox and that would, that would not have been enough at that point in time. Right. What what the GameCube need? So what did the GameCube need to be a success? It needed things to happen before the system came out that didn't happen. Right. And I'm gonna I'm gonna break in. I'm gonna break into, and there'll be more than three, I think. But like, let's start from the beginning. And this one's kind of like the oddball one. Number one, the one of the number one thing, not the I guess not the number one thing, but just number one on on a list of things. Um, number one. The Panasonic Q should have released worldwide, should have been standard. Now, for those who don't know, there there was a there was a a really different looking system called the Panasonic Q, which played DVDs and GameCube games. Mm -hmm. It was a disc loader like thing came out of like a little disc tray came out like a PS2, and it had two grooves for DVDs and GameCube games. Yep. I, I'd go even further and say that Nintendo should not have adopted mini DVDs. I don't think it added anything. It was a weird, staunch anti-piracy measure by them. And it was really more of a hindrance than a help than than anything. I um, loved those things though. Being able to carry my entire game library in a couple of those little wallets yeah. was so I, sick though. It, it, it was kind of it was kind of a pain in the butt, but it, I don't I don't know that like if they just adopted regular DVDs, would that have changed it as much? I don't know, but what would have actually changed the fortunes of the GameCube before the system came out 
was the Panasonic Q becoming worldwide. So it only released in Japan. It had an LCD screen on the thing, and it was it was mm-hmm. chrome and reflective surface. It had light up buttons all over the thing, like the Lit controller port, blue, the yeah, LED blues on the controller ports and stuff. Um, it, it looked played, like an old school Mac. Yeah, kind of. It, it, kind it, of. It, it, it's a really cool device. Yeah, and it, and it came with a remote, and it played DVDs, and it played GameCube games, and it had a, a unique gray controller that said Panasonic on it. That thing should have been adopted worldwide because Nintendo was kind of banking on, well, we we're a dedicated games making company, and we make video games, and that's what we focus on because they're they're Nintendo, and they're just that's just their thing. But the the DVD drives that were in every single GameCube were provided by Panasonic at the time, hence why there is a Panasonic Q. Um, but it only, again, it only came out in Japan. And Nintendo's thing at the time was we're offering value, bang for your butt. Our system's powerful, more powerful than a PS2, but it costs less. And it's just, we're just focused on the game. We're just focused on the games here. In 2001, when it came out, that is not what the mass market wanted. Yeah. what The, the mass market wanted a all-in-one set top box. And really, they, you didn't even like, what that really meant is that they just wanted their DVD player and game player to be the same thing. And out the gate, this is what made PS2 such a desirable machine for you know the first year plus on the market was, it was a cheap it was, DVD player. Yeah, it was a DVD player, and and DVD players could vary wildly in price. And this thing for three hundred could play DVDs and PS2 games. Right, and it was backwards compatible. Now there was nothing Nintendo could have done about backwards compatibility. Like nothing, nothing in, in in any sort of cost-effective way. Um, like Nintendo was already kind of like forced to suffer the consequences of their idiotic decision at the time. It, it was idiotic to continue with cartridge-based cartridge games. Yeah. Game. yeah, it was. It was a. It was a fool's errand, and you know, there's a lot of reasons for it. Like mostly greed, greed and stupidity. Greed from Yamauchi because he wanted to keep charging manufacturing costs. Stupidity from people like the great Miyamoto who didn't want games to have loading. The loading was never really that bad on PlayStation. So, there were some games, I guess. Some but... games, like crappy games, but it's like it was never that bad to a point where like it it impacted the games. Like nobody sat there and said, God, the loading times in Metal Gear Solid and Resident Evil were so bad yeah. and found. No, so greed, mostly greed, a little bit of stupidity. Um, but they were they were gonna have to suffer that consequence. There was no getting around the fact that they couldn't be backwards compatible like PlayStation could. So, but what they could have done to mitigate that cost was release the Panasonic Q everywhere in the world for three hundred dollars, same price as Xbox, same price as the PS2. Xbox could play DVDs. However, Xbox was dumb because they required you to buy a separate remote that would go in like the player four slot on the original Xbox. You had to buy this remote separately. It was another like $20, $30 cost yep. for the console. The, the Panasonic Q came with a remote yeah, for the super DVD dumb. player. So if the Panasonic Q had just been distributed worldwide, now there's people saying, well, the, that would have been, I mean, Panasonic was still around, still manufacturing stuff, you know, in 2001. Um, so it wasn't like Panasonic didn't have any presence in North America. It absolutely did at the time. Um, but like, you know, the, oh, well, that's a lot of manufacturing and that's a lot. They would have had to make so many more. I'm like, yeah, and, and, and it would have sold better. It honestly, because I was there and I was an, I was an adult when this was going down. So I can tell you, first and foremost, the market wanted a DVD player with their game console. And it was a huge reason why the PS2 was hugely successful. And the fact that the GameCube literally had it, but they region locked it and kept it only in Japan was idiotic. Well, I mean, like they could have just made they could have made DVDs work with the original GameCube, too, couldn't they? Not on its own. You would would think would have been had to been like way bigger. Um, you know, the foot I, I, yes, I like, it had to be that much bigger, but yeah, I guess this gray right. slot would not hold, would no way, shape, or form hold a, a whole DVD disc. So, yeah, but like, the, like, what I mean is, like, the the GameCube itself was wide enough for a DVD to go on. They would have just had no, to, it is, is it not? No, like, no, <laughs> uh, I, 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 will, I will find a GameCube and I will pull it out. What? Like the the tray itself, yes, is too small, but they could have widened the tray, right? The whole thing would have had to get about fifty percent bigger. 
Oh, dude, yeah. Wow, I'm misremembering how small those things were. Although, I guess, yeah, we did use to throw them in backpacks and just carry them around. So that's kind of... <laughs> that's that's fair. Um, also, side anecdote about uh, the first time I ever saw the queue. Um, I got duped because uh, our mutual friend, Rodney, who ran the video game store that we used to hang out at, uh, he was the first person I knew that had a queue and he was like, oh yeah, it's so much bigger because it holds three GameCube games and it's just, you can like have a switcher. And I, I bought it 100%. I was like, oh my god, that's so cool. Oh, and no. Mind you, that one, that would definitely be the thing that broke and two, having three games in the, con you're not going to keep the games in the console transporting it. Like there's literally no reason to have a DVD changer in a console. I don't remember if one of these obscure laser discs, like the I don't think there was, but I feel like there was talk a long time ago about something like the Pioneer Laser Active or or some other really early obscure disc-based thing was like trying to maybe offer a, a disc swapping idea. And I'm like, who cares? Like it's stupid. <laughs> like I bought it. Could only you can only play one of the, Yeah, I well, I, rem I remember him saying that. Yeah. I re I remember this I I remember this conversation, but yeah, no, it was just a single disc tray with two grooves in it, you know. GameCube in the middle and a lower, like a lower slot, and then like the DVDs on top. But um, if he's out there, he's an asshole. <laughs> but yes, num number 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 one, kicking it off, the Panasonic Q absolutely should have been. Yeah, so, I, and, it was, and, and it didn't. It didn't need to be the only version. They should have just had two versions of the system. You know, the GameCube and then the Q, three hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. And then they could they could easily have let the market decide which one to restock more of. It would have been the Q. Yeah, well, definitely here, I imagine. Um, they missed the they missed the boat hard by not. I mean, they made a deal to make have Panasonic manufacture their DVD drives, and then they they gave them they threw them the tiniest bone by letting them you know manufacture a, a, a DVD player that plays GameCube games in Japan. But it's like. That was your key in that. That's what was. That's what the world wanted. Yeah, that but, would have been. They would have been uh, pretty, pretty smart and ahead of the game. So, yeah. The thing here. is, the the thing is, there is that this is this is Japan's bubble mentality, where again they're they're not seeing the forest through the trees. They're not seeing the. They only focus. They only ever seem to focus on Japan. What does Japan want? Um, so this was that was this was very it was very foolish of them to not mass produce the Panasonic Q for worldwide market. That was number one. Number two is where I make everyone mad and I don't really care if I do, but number two, Wind Waker. Wind Waker hurt the system. And because of are, graphics, you think? Because or? of graphics, because yeah. of graphics. And they, they kind of hurt the system a little bit or, or, or not a little bit, they hurt the system. And it's kind of a little bit because of Nintendo's own, by Nintendo's own fault. Whereas in Space World 2000, where they showed the GameCube, they revealed the GameCube for the first time, and they had that infamous sword fighting scene between Link and Ganondorf um, that was running on polygons. Like it was saying, like, you know, the, the tech demo, the Space World 2000 tech demo got everyone hyped up like an Ocarina of Time sequel was coming. A year later, Space World 2001, before the system is out, they reveal Wind Waker. There was a ton of backlash to this. And the thing is, is I, at the time, you know, I worked in, in the education um, field. So I worked with, with teachers and, and, and staff and custodial staff who casually enjoyed video games. They were a good pulse of people who, they don't follow games every day. They didn't read IGN all the time. They weren't right. reading, you know, Penny Arcade every, you know, every other day. They just played games. They saw that and like, why did they do that to Zelda? And um, and um, and they and it was like, why did they make it Paper Zelda? They called it Paper Zelda. It was one, one thing I'll, I'll never forget the term because it, it looked like Paper Mario to them. Um, so they heard about it and they and they're like, oh, I, oh, and I said, well, apparently it's fun. I don't want to play that game. That was just their attitude. Like, I don't want to play that. So again, if we going back to two thousand one, I get the, the the main core insular audience of the video game industry were young adult males and nobody wanted to play this kitty looking Zelda game right you know, this Zelda um and I and I was I was you know uh, admittedly enraged I remember being I was a, it was a I was a college at the time 
I went to the college library because they had they had high speed internet, which you know for free, they had plenty of workstations for it. Um, and I remember I read the blurb on, on I think it was IGN that said New Zelda is revealed to be cell shaded, and immediately thought was like Dark Cloud, or or, or something like that. I thought, oh, that'd be great. It's going to look just like the illustrations in Ocarina of Time. No, and then I saw it, and, I'm like, and it was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I was furious. I, 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 I was furious that whole day. I, um, I, inv I, well, I mean, nobody really knows this between me and, and, and Noe, but like, I was so mad. I, I literally punched a hole in a flight stick box at EP games. <laughs> I can only make it worse by saying I liked it. The game's <laughs> good. It's a good game. I like it. <laughs> I liked the game, and I, I, the art style, I didn't dislike. I was fine with. Well, it. here's the thing: the only people in gaming around are people who like it. Because here's the thing that a lot of people don't get: like people have come around on it. No, they didn't. The people who didn't like it don't care. They moved on with their lives. Yeah, and I'm stuck in the past. <laughs> you know what they did? They just moved on to other games. They didn't care that much. Like you know, it, it, it was like, well, that sucks. And then they moved. And then what they do? They went on and bought a PlayStation Two. Why? Because Grand Theft Auto 3 came out that year. And then they bought a second PlayStation 2 because Grand Theft Auto killed one. their first one. <laughs> That's what happened. I bought the Thin. My brother bought the original, and then I ended up buying the Thin, I don't know, like a year or two later when it died. I don't know. How, how long was it wasn't until the Thin PS2 came out? Oh, that was not that was not until like 2004 or something. Yeah, so ours actually lasted a long time. Yeah, I mean... Our original survived i bought the thin because ours our original one died yeah I, I mean everyone's died mine died way before that i went through like three or something um jesus but like yeah so again zelda i can't believe i just called it that wind waker hurt the game hurt hurt the system because before right before the system came out this was their this was like this was the follow-up to Ocarina of Time Majora's Mask. Because not a lot of people played Majora's Mask because Majora's Mask in North America came out the exact same day as the PS2. Um, so everyone's eyes were, were on PS2, not like only only the Nintendo hardcore. So Majora's Mask sold about half as many copies as Ocarina of Time. And then Wind Waker ended up selling even less than that on, on the GameCube. Wow. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can look up the the Asia Numa GDC panel where he talked about Twilight Princess, and he laid it all out in 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 slides and graphs and stuff. And um, fucking bar charts. Well, he he okay, said okay. he he said okay, like he he had a meeting with Nintendo of America, and he said, well, why why are the Wind Waker sales so low? Why are they lower than Majora's Mask? Like this game's really good. You know, he believed in his game, and they said. In Nintendo of America, I can't believe he listened to them. You know, being being a Japanese developer, the fact that he listened to an, uh, someone in Nintendo of America at all shocks me to this day. Um, <laughs> where they told him, like, this is a battle you can't win. People do not want, people are not going to just try the game. I mean, games cost $50. And remember, Nintendo was staunchly anti-rental. So... Um, anti-rental, anti-used game. They were Anti-used game, anti yeah. So... Like the idea that like people were just gonna like oh just trust you, here's fifty dollars to play a game I hate the look of. You're not gonna win this battle, and that's the thing. Everyone who didn't like the look of Wind Waker moved on. They didn't stick around and keep arguing about it on the internet. No, they went to because remember, two thousand one when Wind Waker was revealed was the year that Metal Gear Solid Two came out. Was the year that Eco came out. Was the year that that uh, even Jack, games like Jack and Daxter came out. Was the year Silent Hill Two came out. Was the year Devil May right. Cry came out. You know, was the year Final Fantasy X came out. At least in Japan, like I'm sorry, but and it was the year Grand Theft Auto Three came out. Right. It was. It was. It, Wind Waker was the wrong game at the wrong time. As good as it is. Uh, it, it, it was the wrong it was the wrong thing to do at the wrong time so it, it hurt the system it, it made the perception of a system which already looked like a purple lunchbox um already kind of like solidified how uh, uh, you know how how out of touch as as people would have said because I mean, again, the Wind Waker is the ultimate example in, in a sense of like, okay, graphics don't matter, or like gameplay is king. 
I mean, it, it is a very well done, like it actually nails what it's going for extremely well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, the art style it's going for, like how they, their, their implementation of it is extremely good, especially for the air. The thing is nobody wanted a game to look like that. I, it was definitely in the wrong era to do that. Like it, if you, I think if it came out today on the switch, it might've been different. Oh yeah, totally. But, or even just, even a little, you know, just, just later on the Wii even. You know, yeah. Was, yeah. It would have done really well on the Wii actually, probably. So it was just, it was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And it was not, it was not the time to do this. And, and they're, they're, answer for like for older gamers was metroid prime which is very cool but you also remember metroid never really sold that well there hadn't been a metroid game since the super nes um ocarina of time while not the best selling was like the second or third was like a third best selling game of the n64 yeah the drop off between ocarina yeah. and wind waker Right, because because Wind Waker order. for most people, Wind Waker is this was going to be the sequel to Ocarina of Time. Right, like Majora's Mask was called Zelda Guidance, because Zelda Side Story. This was going to be your sequel to Ocarina of Time, the sequel to your third best selling game of your whole system, and it and it a drastic tonal shift lost people, lost people hard, hurt the system, convinced people it wasn't going to be worth buying. To follow that up, a year later, they sold Rare, or they sold their their 49% share in Rare. The Stamper Brothers owned 51% of Rare. They wanted to sell their, shake, their share, and they offered Nintendo, and Nintendo said, nah, even though the Nintendo had 49% of shares of Rare. Still the wildest business decision I can, I can possibly think of from their end. Like it, it, yeah. they wouldn't have, it just wouldn't have been that expensive to buy them out. Right. And, and from what I understand, there was a little bit of animosity, a little bit of weirdness between Rare and Nintendo. Um, a lot of this comes from the fact that that Rare wasn't ready to go. Like they were one of the earliest people to get a GameCube dev kit and they didn't have a game ready for launch. It took a year to get Star Fox Adventures out. Um, and, yeah. and that was, and that was a, a, a game that was changed from, from, that was an N64 game that they just sort of like up scaled or to, to be a game game and changed to a Star Fox game. And, and there was no like concrete release date for, for their other games like Cameo at the time, um, or Perfect Dark Zero. So Nintendo sold Rare. They sold Rare to Microsoft. Um, this was a bad call because GoldenEye was their second best-selling game on the N64. So you can kind of see where things are kind of going here, right? Um, their second best-selling game was a shooter that was, you know, a multiplayer phenomenon. And they've decided to sell that company really early into the system's life. Their third best-selling game of all time is a big fantasy epic, and they make it look like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You can kind of see where these are. These are just like piling up bad decisions here. Their launch game and best-selling game was Mario 64, which was not ready for the system's launch. They launched with a weird kiddish Resident Evil spinoff called Luigi's Mansion, but featured no platforming whatsoever. A, kind of a neat game in its own right, but... but I did like that game, to be fair. Your flag, but as a flagship game to launch your system with, you know, because... NES launches with Super Mario Brothers. Super NES launches with Super Mario World. N64 launches with Super Mario 64. GameCube launches with Luigi's Mansion. Luigi's Mansion's a good time. Luigi's Mansion ain't Super Mario 64. And, and the follow-up to your best-selling game of all time was not, not, not Super Mario Brothers to Super Mario World, Super Mario 64 to like, okay, was it going to be like Super Mario Universe, Super Mario Galaxy, but Super Mario Sunshine. Which I also liked, but I uh... great game. But like again, like Mario clean Mario cleans up graffiti in your follow up to your best selling yeah. N sixty four game. Yeah, Mario I'll does community fun. service. There were just bad decisions being made by Nintendo everywhere from the start. I, the odd thing is, is that like again, all of these ideas had they been done now which i guess technically they are done now 
like Super Mario Sunshine probably would have had it not ever existed before might have cleaned up again on the Switch. Right. Like well, it's almost a good testament to that. Yeah, like the vibes. I I I don't know how you capture the vibes, but like all of these decisions now are good decisions because they aren't competing with anyone in a sense. Like yeah. Nintendo isn't trying they're doing the blue ocean strategy, right? They they don't care about uh about necessarily what Sony or Microsoft are doing and so they're doing their own thing. And so these ideas would have actually probably been pretty strong now. Now, I'm biased because I liked, in hindsight, I liked the GameCube a lot. At the time, I was a big PlayStation fanboy. Uh, but I like the GameCube a lot, too. I love the GameCube. Yeah, uh, in, in hindsight, like, I really loved it, and I, I had a pretty great I, library. And I loved it at the time, but I, I'm just saying here, the reasons it wasn't successful are kind of obvious when you think about what was announced when. The the only moves that yeah. Nintendo did at the time that were kind of in 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 league with trying to retain the older audience that the N sixty four was sort of built upon was Metroid Prime. Yeah. Again, though, it was trying to bring back an IP that had been dormant since the Super NES era, and and then they were going to do it in first person, which nobody was sure of. Everyone had heavy doubts about that. Um. Eternal Darkness by the Legacy of Kane developers, and then the right. big, re- and then the big Resident Evil get from Capcom. So, and, and the big Resident Evil thing was pretty great. It was, yeah, it was. But... Did thirteen come out on every system, or was thirteen a? Yeah. Because uh, I, I, I played it on GameCube, mm-hmm. and I really loved it, but I didn't know any other GameCube like player. Yeah. So I'm I'm not I wasn't really sure if that because it was 13 a flop because it was kind of a beloved game I don't know I, besides it did okay it wouldn't have saved the system but right I was just wondering like they they really didn't have that many because they had they had like there was a time splitters released on GameCube yeah, that two. wasn't an ex, that wasn't exclusive no. either mm-hmm. time splitters one. Only came out on PS2, uh, like at launch, right? Which is why Time Splitters One is so bare bones. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I guess you're right. They really, they really kind of went for left field with the GameCube, and they doubled down on that in a way. If if that makes sense, like because they they yeah. didn't go after graphics anymore. Yeah, but like they were sort of double down, doubling down on their instincts that they that led them to the GameCube. And the games that were on the GameCube, they just went even wilder with the Wii. Yeah, it's just, if anything, though, the GameCube was just this really weird thing where Nintendo's philosophy of always trying to bring something new to the table, it bit them a bit in the butt with the GameCube. Because Mm -hmm. people just wanted a bigger, prettier Ocarina of Time. They didn't want a cel-shaded Zelda. That was about sailing. Okay. Yeah. They they wanted a bigger, bigger, prettier Mario 64. And they kind of got that with Sunshine, but like Sunshine was like this whole cleanup graffiti on an island resort. Why am I doing communities? Isle Delfino. Isle Delfino. Like what? Like like in a sense, also like Mario Kart Double Dash, which came out way later, was another one where it's like, okay, okay, cool. I guess two cards. I guess I kind of just wanted more Mario Kart. But here, but that kind of leads into the next thing, you know, I want to talk about too was Nintendo's refusal to embrace online, even though they had the capacity to do it, was a huge missed opportunity. Iwata yeah. famously said, users do not want to play games online. Might be the dumbest thing he ever said, ever. <laughs> Unfortunately, this kind of really came from. Wada lived in Japan, and Nintendo only ever focused on Japan. They lived in this weird bubble where if people in Japan, they, they're they on their flip phones, you know, they're maybe on their Game Boy Advances on the trains, they're not at home, they don't want to play games online at home. That, that what, like, online gameplay wasn't hugely embraced by Japan in the early 2000s. Which is so, funny because they had super fast internet. And they, they, yeah, they did, and they do. But, but like he just completely misread the, the the room on on that. And I think a lot of that just boiled down to the fact that like his 
his gut instincts or his data or his research, whatever you want to call it, was based on a, a hyper centralized marketplace in Japan. And again, can't see outside of his own bubble. Um, so that's that's the only and that is the only rationale I can come up with for why Iwata would say something so dumb. Um, Nintendo's really carried that forward, though. Yeah. Well, it, again, they had they had modems and broadband adapters for the GameCube to play yeah. Fantasy Star Online with, and right. I did, and I played a lot of it. It was it was one of the it great. Was, yeah. Luckily, it was one of the best online games around at the time. But it was like the idea that then you started having all these PS2 and Xbox games started coming out, and they had online gameplay, and they and they they all had it except Nintendo. Nintendo didn't have it. And the, the the tiniest thing they threw was like Mario Kart Double Dash and like I think F Zero and and maybe either I think uh, 1080 Avalanche. They could do LAN. They could do LAN. You could connect two GameCubes with like with a broadband adapter and a LAN cable, and it's like you just really don't get it, do you? Um. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I think Nintendo's always focused on that I really love is like they focus on couch co-op a lot. And I wonder yeah. if that mentality, they didn't think there was a market for online because they're the couch co-op guys. Yeah, because like the PS2 still only had two controller ports. We have four, um, you know, and then the other thing sort of adding to your to your yeah. The Game Boy Advance connectivity. They thought, oh, people are going to love this Game Boy Advance connectivity. Game Boy Advance is our Trojan horse in the game. No, it's not. No, nobody, nobody was interested in 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 buying an extra cable to connect their Game Boy Advance to the GameCube. Because the other thing too is that it, that didn't really do much. Um, and then and then then Four Swords Adventure was a, sort of their flagship game for it. And I remember Miyamoto has has complain about man that was such a great game i'm really sad and people didn't want to buy it i'm like because it came with one cable in the box and then you needed to find three other friends who all had a game Boy advance and they all went out and bought their own game boy advance link cable and had them all go in and hook up and sit down and connect all their game boy advances up to your to one dude's gamecube to play four swords it was a it was a pain in the butt it was a hassle like they, they were kind of getting in into an almost like Sega like thing where it's like, yeah, people didn't buy the 32X because it was a hassle. <laughs> so what does the world look like if they if all of this would have been a hit? If they would have if they would have nailed this or if the timing would have been right for this, you know, does online gaming explode the way it did if GameCube is hyper successful without having I don't think GameCube is is successful without embracing online. I think it has to. The, if GameCube were to be successful, it would have, A, the queue needed to be standard. B, Wind Waker needed to look like that tech demo in 2000. C, Nintendo needed to buy Rare and keep Rare. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, as well as doing that, but also at the same time pursue, you know, that Capcom deal. The Capcom deal kind of fell into their lap because of the, because of how Sony treated Mikami. Um, but like keep Rare. And then the, the, the big fourth thing is embrace online. So that's what they needed to do from the beginning. Like there are minor things they also could have done, such as maybe maybe not had maybe gone with orange and black instead of purple and black because they're like, oh, indigo is the color of royalty. Nobody cares in North America. That was a huge that was a huge you know disconnect from 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 worldwide cultural whatever. People in America looked at the, the purple GameCube and thought it's it's a toy. It's a little kitty's lunchbox. They even admitted that Nintendo has even admitted that in, in, in looking back in the future. That's fine, but purple is the superior color. Whatever. Uh, orange and black. And it probably should have just been mostly black, maybe orange. There should have just been multiple. They should have had a, a clear few, version. A few. And, you know, and they ended up mostly selling $99 uh, platinum chrome colored game cubes anyways yeah. in the end. Um, but again, the Q should have been should have been with the Q again. It should have followed up with with an, uh, um, an Ocarina of Time looking Zelda game. So if if not I mean, the Wii, if not the Wii after uh, after the GameCube, because the GameCube's such a success, what do you think they're like? What's what's the hypothetical next system? Mm. To, uh, do they skip right to the Wii U? 
a power a much more powerful box, but the the same no, idea. I, 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 I think the, the, the path that led down to the Wii U is completely altered if the Wii gets altered, right? Um, and again, I want to say, I think maybe just fifth, fifth and foremost, Yamauchi needed to get the F over his, his, uh, um, his anger towards Square. And in fact, it should have started money hatting Square more, <laughs> like, than they already did. Like, they should have started, instead of, instead of a dummy corporation just for Crystal Chronicles, they literally should have said, we will give you a huge deal. Not only will we let you make Game Boy Advance games, we'll even cut, like, you know, cartridge manufacturing costs for you. If you promise exclusivity to us, swear fealty to us and bring like, you know, bring Final Fantasy back. Like Final Fantasy 12 is now a GameCube exclusive, like something like that. 10 was already gone at that point. That would have been like, a, that would have been a big thing. If they would have played hardball to get Capcom back. Um, another thing they should have done, they should have had a ZL trigger. Only having the one Z button on one side, huge mistake for multi-platform games. Um but like the controller could have been a little better designed with the shoulder buttons in, in mind. But anyways, like well, that, for... it was small. It was built for small hands. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, though, like yeah, the thing is to me is like go go harder, go harder after Square, um, and and uh, uh, you know keep rare, buy rare, make keep rare happy, um, and then all the other things I already said with the online, with with the the with Zelda, with. Um, with the queue, you do all that, and then what happens? It will definitely take a chunk out of out of PlayStation. And again, they would have also had to go after Grand Theft Auto to make sure Grand Theft Auto was also showing up on the GameCube as well as the Xbox and PS2. Part of me says that that never would have happened. I think it would have. It would have left that one out. I don't know. I don't know that it would have because again, we're talking about a GameCube that didn't immediately try to reject. Um, reject the, the older audience because in 2003 i forget which which uh which nutsack at nintendo of america said on stage at their presentation mario will never do anything as 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 stupid or vile as as, as shooting hookers um which was a direct shot across the bow at rockstar which was like okay yeah and then, then and then and your system is is dying and that's this that's the statement you want to do like you know Mario's an Italian plumber. He's killed a hooker or two, okay? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, he's disposed of a body somewhere, and that body being a hooker is... Or hell, he's if, found one. He's found one in his on, on the job, um, like, being a plumber. So, but anyways, like, d like, go after Rockstar, too. I mean, the writing, was on, the writing was on the wall instantly. Grand Theft Auto 3 came out in 2001 and was an instant phenomenon. It yeah. wasn't like they built up to it. It exploded immediately, and it never came down from that eye. So they well, it was the beginning of uh, of really open world being a selling point. Yeah, well, because the thing is, Grand Theft Auto Three didn't come to Xbox right away. Um, it came to Xbox a, like a couple of years later, mm -hmm. and and that was after the that the dust had settled from launch, and like it was obvious GameCube was a was a failure, and GameCube's only audience were Nintendo files. And young children, which was a small section at the time of the gaming audience. A small section now, but now all those people are adults who are going to say, I love the GameCube. GameCube was my life. What are you talking about? I'm like, well, the numbers don't lie, you know, and this spelled disaster for you at sacrifice. Um, so I was so annoyingly pro Sony, even though I owned a bunch of games I really loved for GameCube. God, I shit on the GameCube so many. I was such an edgy little fuck. <laughs> Whatever some people were like, <laughs> some people were like, is RE4 enough to save the GameCube? I'm like, not now. If RE4 no. came out way earlier, maybe. Um, but I was such I was such a PlayStation like fanboy that uh I almost didn't play RE4 when it was because it was exclusive for like a year on not nine months, nine months yeah. a year. I almost refused to play it, and I ended up getting it on a fluke. I ended up like there was a copy, and I ended up getting it and playing it, and like my favorite game of all time. But yeah. uh but yeah, I, I almost refused, refused to play it on an inferior system. Mm -hmm. Never. So what does this do? Let's let's say the GameCube was successful. Let's say like it was successful at the gate from the start from all the things I said, right? Mm -hmm. I think what it does is 
One, it hurts Microsoft hard. Uh, Microsoft already abandoned the Xbox OG early, mm -hmm. um, specifically to get ahead of Sony. Because in, in their minds, and they were kind of right about it at the time when and like, and Peter Moore was part of this, was like, our biggest problem was we came a year late. We can't be a year late anymore. We should be at the same time, or we should be before Sony. We should have staff. Like, his mind was like, he who gets to 10 million first wins kind of thing, or 10 or 20. I forget what the, the number was. So their big drive okay. at the time was we need to get ahead of Sony. I don't know if that changes Microsoft's outlook much, but I think what it does is it would have made... It would have made Xbox the also ran. Um, it, it would have really, I think, I think if Nintendo was successful with the GameCube, I think Microsoft getting any Japanese support would have been even harder going into the 360 era. It would have almost had to abandon Japan. Would have probably all they, they did abandon, like practically abandoned it. But Microsoft was able to leverage the fact that, like in the largest market in, in the world, you know they. They may not be able to sell your games in Japan, but you can sell them in North America, and we have a bigger audience, so you should make games for Xbox. So I think I think a lot of these Xbox uh, games, uh, you know, uh, Japanese third party games, maybe don't come out on Xbox or or right. you know, or, or or they're at least multi platform or something like that, right? Unless unless Microsoft publishes it themselves, um, I think it chinks a little bit. Of, I don't think it. I don't think GameCube overtakes PlayStation. I don't think there's. I don't know that there's any world when that where that happens, but I think it would have been way more even even Stevens um, a bit with it. It definitely would have removed Microsoft. Like it would have made Microsoft. A, truly, it would have made Microsoft the third player. Yeah. In the game, but I'm not really like the games that came out on ps2 were sort of iconic you know what i mean like they yeah, shaped that's what i'm thinking i don't think <laughs> like, that's I don't know that, yeah. when i say gamecube's success i don't mean that it was more successful than ps2 i just mean that it was a success right they didn't they didn't pivot immediately after it it didn't send like a shock to their system at how big of a failure it was yeah yeah i, just, yeah, I see what you're saying so I, I i think what what will become interesting is that as i think Certain things play out the same. I think Sony again goes crazy hard into PS3 because it, Crazy Ken, you know, goes and 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 drains billion dollar plus down the drain on the PS3 to offer the Cadillac of consoles, as he called it. Um, I, I think Sony still does that, but I think Nintendo, I, I with the Wii, I think Nintendo pivots to maybe a three hundred to three hundred fifty dollar. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what else to call it, but let's call it a GameCube two. For for simplicity's sake, three fifty four hundred dollars, right? Um, I think Microsoft has a ha much harder time getting off the ground because uh, Halo three was not ready for launch. It was not ready for two years into the system's life, mm -hmm. and at the time, Halo was all Microsoft had. Gears came along and basically gave them a. a real boost in the arm in 2006 right um before, and, until halo 3 came out the following year and then halo two months later was eclipsed by cod 4 um but microsoft has a much tougher time reaching reaching market penetration and in one and in my hypothetical what if nintendo kept rare nintendo embraced online perfect dark zero was a great game it was yeah yeah, uh, not not the one we got, but Perfect Dark Zero in this timeline is a great game. Well, it would have been an amazing online shooter, yeah. Right, so Nintendo has Metroid for single player. It has Perfect Dark, you know, as a big old, you know, big, you know, big, you know, good exclusive. And then that goes into GameCube 2, which is like Perfect Dark 3, if you will, which is absolutely competing toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with Halo. You but know, does and, that also mean that Rare, that's all Rare makes? After that point, they become a new Infinity Ward where they just shoot out? No, because that's not how Nintendo operates. It's not how Nintendo's ever operated. Um, Rare doesn't go into the death spiral it did on on the on the 360 era, during the Don Matrick era of, 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 of shite. Um, Rare gets to keep making Rare games. 
you know, Grab by the Ghoulies would still exist. It'd be a GameCube game. It would do just as poorly on GameCube as it did on Xbox. Might have done um, better. I don't know. <laughs> maybe a little better, but like, but Rare still is Rare. They get to make Banjo 3. You know, they get to continue their successful franchises. There isn't any any weird like uh, oversight that, that Microsoft had over them and how they very poorly managed that studio. Um, again, I don't think I don't I don't think Nintendo pivots into the Wii. What I do think Nintendo does for GameCube 2, I think Nintendo will double down on connectivity. So I think the GameCube 2 and the DS become even more connected. They can become even more hyper-focused on connectivity between the devices. Now, remember, mm -hmm. the DS was online capable. It could go online with, wi with a Wi-Fi signal. Yeah. So I think in this hypothetical future where GameCube 2 happens and it's a much more powerful system than the Wii, I think Nintendo doubles down harder on portability connectivity. Because one, they're still like focused on Japan or whatever. You so, could also see a world where you get the Wii U tablet, but it's not a tablet. It's the fucking, it's the DS or the DS2 or whatever is the tablet to your to GameCube the, 3 at that point. That, like, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of where the future goes, where Nintendo tries to do this weird, like, because they are all about hybrid. Like, we have a hybrid portable, portable right. home, yeah, yeah, yeah. home console right now. But I think they write out that, the, the, the connectivity thing, not even because the, the audience necessarily will demand it, but because Nintendo's convinced it's a great idea. Um, and in a way, though, it is. Do you remember one of the coolest things about the Dreamcast was like being able to take the memory card and a lot of the times it would have like mini games yep. based on it. Like imagine that idea, but now it's like your DS is your memory card. Like you can go over your houses, connect your DS to their GameCube and play yeah. there. Or Game Boy Micro even. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That would have been, that's actually better or a more apt comparison. But like the idea that like, your DS is almost like your mobile phone is today, where it's just like you just have it on you if you're a gamer because you just take mm -hmm. it wherever. Like, that is, I guess, that's probably the most intriguing idea is like, do we get more of the best parts of Nintendo if the GameCube is a success, or does it change game? Does it change Nintendo enough to where like, we don't get a lot of the things we love post GameCube because GameCube was like, did it strangle a lot of these things we love in the womb? I think the, I think it, in, in a sense, yes, but mostly for, for those weird, like obviously we sports never comes to pass. Right. Um, the, the era of, of um... hot girl gamers gone. <laughs> oh my God. No, uh, the, the era <laughs> of, of casual, you know, casual motion controls never comes fast. Now, some people will, will hear when I say, like, oh, the world of, of casual motion control gaming never happens. And some people will be thinking, what a wonderful world in their head. Um, but here's the thing. Here, here's where I'm going to get a little bit hyperbolic. I think the industry itself suffers if the GameCube it was a success. I think this is sort of a, a monkey's paw thing. You know why? Because Nintendo never pivots to the blue ocean the game industry stays insular. They continue to fight like sharks in, in bloodied waters, you know, for, for just a, an ever slowly, slowly increasing industry rather than the, the sort of boom town that Nintendo made everyone stop and realize like, oh, because, you know, even though you know, Microsoft and, and PlayStation both had Connect and the PS Move and the iToy and they're like, they all tried to immediately yeah. follow Nintendo out into the blue ocean after they proved how successful it was. Um, but I think this is a bit of a dark future because I think the industry doesn't still doesn't really embrace, you know, every, every type of age, gender, you know, range kind of thing. We're still a, right. You don't have nerd culture become mainstream in a way. Cause it, when I, when I say like the hot girl gamers, it's like, again, every dorm room you went to, like every, it's the first time. I ever knew like actually I think most every girl I knew had a Wii mm -hmm. like and it, because it was accessible or it wasn't intimidating like nerd culture for the longest time was inaccessible and sort of intimidating and 
really fucking angry. Uh, like, really angry. It, it still is sort of... It's your own death. That's what toxicity breeds from. <laughs> nah, well, it, but there was like this... You used to get bullied for it all the time, so you were like really insular and you wore it like a badge, right? By the time I was graduating high school and we were going and I was going into college, that was drastically changed because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm not going to say it was entirely because of Nintendo, but it was because like gaming was opening up quite a bit, like yeah. video games in general, part of no, the, the Internet. Yeah, but, and I, partially I don't want to I don't want to take away from what Apple actually did with the iPhone, how that opened up a huge new market for for people. Well, it also um, made like technology generally more attractive. But the thing, but make... the thing is, with mobile gaming, it, it it is mass market. It opened up to a lot mm -hmm. of people, but it didn't socially open things up. Not like Wii Sports did. Right. Wii Sports had the social aspect that mobile gaming never really did. Like even when they try with Pokemon Go, it's mostly people just like, you know, they're just like walking around with their phone, like. Again, it's one in the morning. You're in a dorm room playing Wii Bowling. Yeah. Like, that's good times. It I mean, is not being time. in a dorm room, that's sticky. But <laughs> the rest of it's very nice. Ooh, Jesus. But yeah, I think we actually go into a dark future. And I don't know necessarily what it looks like where like gaming is still hyper-focused on, on only, only the male crowd. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure we'll still get to the sad dad point you know, of gaming in the PS3 era. But um, again, like I, I'm sure a bunch of chuds would probably think if gaming would stay, if gaming stayed the boys clubhouse, the, 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 the boys treehouse clubhouse mentality, it was, I think we'd be a worse off. We'd be worse off for it. It'd be so much more leisure suit, Larry. God, so many more. Leisure suit Larry sucks. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm going to tell you that right now, Andrew. The only thing I can say for Leisure Suit Larry in any sort of positive light is at least to try to have, at least to try to be funny about it. At least to try to have humor. Because the thing is, at the end of the day, game point and click it, games with, with explicit material, that's been, that, there's there's thousands of them on the internet and in Japan and on, and on Newgrounds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's sort of like uh, the relationship or love simulator you right, know. so mm, uh, we're good. Uh, you know what? If for so to end the episode, I'm gonna say I'm gonna suggest a next what if that we do, and you can tell mm. me if it's good. And I'm not saying this will be the next episode of the podcast, but it is a what if that this caused me to think about. Uh, what if Xbox never happens? What does the industry look like mm. if Microsoft never jumps into gaming? If it's still, you know, Sega. I mean, the Dreamcast survives much longer, probably, but uh, oh, probably not. I will well, argue that. Uh, so it's still Sega, it's still Nintendo, and it's still PlayStation. What does Atari have a comeback? <laughs> no, no, I think it. I, I, my, my gut feeling is that like there just isn't a third. <laughs> Yeah, if you're if you're interested in that, what if you tell us in the comments of this one? Assuming no, it's a good one. I think we should do yeah. that. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, what if Microsoft never jumped in? But yeah, my my assessment is if GameCube was a success, it would have led to a darker future. And I yeah. think and I think the 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 all encompassing nature of the game industry would have taken either a lot lot longer to get here, or it wouldn't have happened at all. Probably just a lot longer to get here. It was an inevitability, I feel, but like. I actually think Nintendo needed to suffer <laughs> to 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 get the to move the industry forward to where it is right. today. Nintendo needed to suffer, uh, uh, you know, a, a few bad setbacks to get where they are today. And and hell, that they suffered again with the Wii U, and it led to their best selling system of all time. Yeah, which is actually oddly enough, circling back to Xbox, kind of what happened to xbox over the last couple generations and maybe yeah. maybe then so. launching the xbox one hurt that system so hard that it's either yeah, well, feeling it they're feeling it two generations later and even phil said this much <laughs> yeah that's i we'll see if they have the if they do a blue ocean yeah i i don't think they will switch strategies though they'll double down i think they are i think their blue ocean is now i'm just gonna put games anywhere and I'll get Absolutely. you to play. I'll get you to play them anywhere. I'll get you to yeah. play them on your TV. 
they're it's, they're it's murdering the first party the idea of first party that's uh yeah i like that Good um <laughs> I, I'm interested. Well, I'm I'm always interested in sort of like doing their own thing. Like yeah. it, it's why Nintendo doing its own thing. Like, yeah, I would like them to have more graphical powerhouses, but at the same time, I can't fault them for what they did. Like, I'm I'm happy with what they did. I like the Switch, but you know, so if Microsoft does something crazy, if they get a little crazy and go off on their own if they kill first party and it ends up as a big boon for the industry overall like that's great that is um, great. but we have producers to thank if you're interested in becoming a patron at any level please check out patreon.com slash eov games podcast due to the week was zyber Knight. thank you zyber Knight. and our producers for this episode are austinite zyber Knight, mutton chops johnson the pink hammer Skrunami, karoi 35 hyper viper 89 hockey kong 64 lcl mayhem and ziggy z thank you dudes We'll catch you next time. Later, dudes.